Um, well, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here tonight, particularly in the wonderful company of Maria Pinto. Um, like many American women, I first became acquainted with Maria Pinto's work through a profound and growing interest in Michelle Obama's style. As Michelle Obama became more prominent in the public eye from 2004 onward, so too did Maria Pinto. In 2007, when Vanity Fair named Michelle Obama to their international best dress list, Maria Pinto was listed as Michelle Obama's favorite designer. When Vogue ran a feature story um, in their September 2000 issue, now the September issue, uh, Mrs. Obama chose a black sheath dress for her full, photo, full page photograph. In the credits, it was listed as Maria Pinto. To be an admirer of Michelle Obama's wardrobe through 2000 and 2008, 2007 and 2008, was really to be an admirer of Maria Pinto's work. For Michelle Obama's most high profile appearances on the campaign trail, she would turn time and time again to Maria Pinto sheath dresses cut in luxurious jewel tone fabrics and masterfully tailored. In, in October 2008, I was on a business trip to Chicago. At that point, my interest in Michelle Obama's style had become an all-consuming passion, manifesting through a blog. <laughs> I slipped out on a lunch break in search of more fashionable pastures. I hopped into a cab uh, to North Jefferson Street in Chicago's West Loop to find Maria Pinto's newly opened boutique nestled among converted loft spaces and warehouses. As I entered the boutique, my eyes delighted not in the vast wonderland of sheath dresses I expected, but in the swooping asymmetrical lines of silk and sequined frocks and the quiet sensuality of a black evening dress featuring a lace cutout at the back. It was then that I realized the sheath dresses, while thoroughly lovely, only told half the story. In Chicago and among a broader in the no fashion crowd, Maria Pinto has a long and faithful following. She's firmly rooted in the world that real women live in, Wendy Donahue of the Chicago Tribune told me. Her aim is to make women feel great in their clothes, to make a woman really shine in clothes that flatter her body. Her career is one that spans 20 years, beginning with her education at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, followed by several years in New York, working under the legendary Jeffrey Bean. Later, she returned to Chicago to launch her own label and business in the 1990s. She's not only a revered designer, but an accomplished businesswoman and entrepreneur. In 2009, she was inducted as a member of the CFDA. One gets a sense that while the First Lady's taste for, Michelle, for Maria Pinto's designs has introduced her name and designs to a broader audience, it was an introduction overdue, or perhaps just in time. In the next hour, we'll certainly look at those and celebrate those fabulous sheath dresses, so loved by our First Lady, but importantly, we'll have the chance to explore Maria Pinto's background and to better understand her design perspective and design ethos. So, with that, um, <laughs> I thought you know, we could start at the sort of go way back. Um, you know, in your interview in Mrs. O, The Face of Fashion Democracy, you talked about um, where your love for fashion came from. In fact, having a subscription to Women's Wear Daily at 13. So I was just hoping you could tell us um, sort of the early roots of this interest. Um, it really started with our. It's kind of loud. Um, it really started with art and uh, making objects and. And then being one of those, you know, little girls that wanted more clothes than mom was willing to buy or could buy. So there was a sewing machine in the house and I quickly taught myself how to sew. And my art sort of started moving itself into uh, creating clothes as well. And you've been, you, I know I mentioned in the interview before that you made your own prom dress from a Halston pattern. Yeah, it was a little cutting edge for where I was coming from. <laughs> it was a, a beautiful dress and if I had it, you'd want to still wear it. It was, you know, do you remember Kiana? Jersey. We'd want to ratchet that up to a nice jersey, but it was Kiana. And it was a peach color, and I had a tan, and I looked really good in it. Nice. <laughs> and I would still wear it today. It was really great. Uh, and so at 30, in fact, I think you said that you enrolled at the School of the Art Institute of mm -hmm. Chicago. So mm -hmm. what, what prompted that decision, and what had you kind of done you know, up until then? Um, what prompted was turning 30. I um, had a family that had a restaurant business, and um, not unfamiliar to the stereotype Italian families, you know, you're kind of indentured into this business. And finally, the, what I like about age and turning a certain decade is it kind of prompts you to say, okay, am I doing what I really want to do? And I loved what I did, and I, we had a beautiful five-star restaurant that was noted by people around the world. They met really interesting people. I think that kept me there longer. And so 29 approached, I'm like, I'm not happy. So I worked full-time and I went to school full-time, and it was the best thing I ever did. 
that. And then, so from the Art Institute, you went, you landed a job with Jeffrey Bean. Um, in fact, it was an internship. Okay which was much coveted and not very easy to get. It took a lot of knocking on the door, and I became very good friends. You know the, the story of the gatekeeper? I became very good friends with the gatekeeper, the woman at the front desk, a lovely woman. And I kept going back. And um, because I was a really, um, I was kind of obsessed with being with someone who I thought was a master on all levels in terms of cut and fabrics that he used. And so I, w I decided I was going to do it on any terms. and I worked there for two, two collections, and I was able to see every aspect of the process, from the show to sh working in the store on Fifth Avenue. So it was a great experience. Wow. Yeah. And so what, I mean, do you still feel influences of that experience in your work today, or are there lessons that you've you know, carried with you through the years? Um, I, you know, I think working for someone like a Jeffrey Bean, there was a certain sort of a error in the environment that was of uh, intense, an intensity of uh, reverence. You never, you barely looked at him, you know, kind of morning. And, um, and he was very disciplined, and his team was very focused. Um, Albert, who is with Lan Van now, was there, and Peter. And they were amazing men to watch, and to watch someone like this who was very precise, and every week there was a specific agenda. And it wasn't a lot of insanity that a lot of companies work with in terms of building up toward the collection where it's you know mayhem for days and no sleep. It was much more, um, much more professional and uh, organized, but yet really, ultra, extremely creative. And so, in just landing that opportunity, was it? I know you talked about some persistence, but was there you know something that was sort of the final, the final getting you over the hump to kind of get that opportunity? Um, I think it's just timing, like everything I've experienced to yeah. date. Timing is everything. Yeah. So then after that wrapped up, you made the decision to go back to Chicago and started your own business, which seems like, because then, it, you, I mean, we're in your early 30s, it seems like quite a plunge. So mm -hmm. how did you decide to do that? I think everything I decided to do is kind of out of a bit of insanity um, <laughs> or not, over, not overthinking it. I think having worked for a family business gave me the courage to have a business to begin with. And um, I, you know, I, I never thought about it much. I just knew I wanted to do something on my own. And so I started out of a loft, kind of stereotype story. And uh, I, my first client was Ultimo in Chicago, which at the time, Ultimo was like one of the premier stores in the world. And um, she was amazing. And um, then I sent my um, press release out to Bergdorf and Barney's, and they immediately made appoints, appointments with me. So again, I say it's a timing thing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I have no, there's no formula to this. And then I wanted to ask, um, you know, one thing that surprised me when I did go to your store for the first time was op you know, opening the, the drawers and all these amazing, luxurious wraps and scarves. Yeah. And that's actually what you started out with. Is that right. correct? Exactly. I just have a few, I think, images. Yeah. These um, are all hand embellished, yeah. So how did you, I mean, how did you choose that as the, your kind of starting point for your business? Um, I, I was so anxious to get started because I was so old that um, I realized I could. I, and also, I, I didn't realize this, but it was right at the beginning of the whole pashmina craze. Mm -hmm. And it was so not, you know, um, this was not a business strategy plan by any stretch. My timing couldn't have been better because it was the big push on wrap. People were really, women were really paying attention to the wraps. And that's what I started with because I knew I could produce them. I literally started making them myself and did the first season's production myself. And and so I knew it was something I could manage. And uh, then it gave me the courage to sort of seek out investors and take it to the next level. Wow. So all, I mean, these are from, I guess, more recent seasons. But when um, you started out, this, some of, all of the kind of hand, yeah, like, yeah, wow. Yeah, round the clock, sewing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and a lot of them are manipulated pieces of fabric, like the one on the left is all pieces of taffeta that are marrowed together. So I had marrow machines, or this machine took a beating. But that was kind of a concept that came from one of the first collections. Not that particular piece, but that idea. And that's continued on with the collection. So then from there, you expanded into evening wear and then day wear. So what, you know, what set you on that kind of evolution of having a broader Collection. Well, I think it was a combination of things. I mean, I think that the wrap is interesting, but it's not as, uh, if it doesn't have the three-dimensional aspect of a garment. And so as a designer and as an artist, I was a little frustrated because you can only take it so far. And then also my 
a lot of my clients were saying, you know, it would be really great if you had a, a dress because some of the pieces were so gorgeous that it would, and the colors got, became limited if they had to, if you buy it in an accessory department, it's kind of limiting in terms of the kind of colors you would offer. Whereas if I can offer the garment that goes with it, it, may, it made it even become more relevant. And then, as you, so as you got into the evening wear and day wear, did you immediately have a distinct kind of point of view as a designer, or is that something that you evolved to? I think we, it's still, I mean, I think we all, I think it's a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. I think it's all, all, um, a constant evolution. I mean, I feel, feel strongly about where I am at today, but I think there's always a being an op having an open mind to you know, seeing things in a new way and evolving. Were there any kind of constants that you saw in your, you know, that were carrying over from season to season? Um, work or things that were important to you? Absolutely. I think first, first and foremost is the material. Textiles are really important to me. Um, so I've always used and made it a, you know, I, it wasn't even something I could consider. Uh, fabric had to be really beautiful and quality and workmanship and fit. Very important. Great. Um, just kind of moving on to a new topic, I guess. I was curious you know, what your starting point is for a new collection. And I thought you, maybe I could, um, I have some images from your spring 2010 collection. Mm -hmm. If um, you could use that as an example of what your starting point was for this. Um, the, um, it starts with an inspiration. And the inspiration for this collection was Tango. Mm -hmm. and. And, and I, don't, I don't like an inspiration to be like, you know, you look at it and go, oh, she went to Argentina, tango. So it's always more, um, it's kind of there, but not there. <laughs> That's, That's definitely tango. tango. Yeah. This is so dancing for the, in the, with the stars, whatever that show is called. But this on is so amazing. It's 30 yards of fabric. It's all hand cut wow. chiffon. And they're all sewn on in a spiral. And that's what creates all the movement. So it starts out with an inspiration. And then I go to Paris to a trade show for fabric, Premier Vision. And then you have, with the parameters of the idea of tango, to me, it was about the tension of the dance and the seduction. And so I, everything I, um, Apply, I applied that idea to everything in terms of color, so it was kind of the extremes, like the fuchsia, mimosa, and then there's contrasting that was like mud and sand and indigo. So it's the, the theme sort of prevails over everything, movement. Um, this black dress was kind of a derivative because it became all these panels and about movement. It's like a little trapeze with a bias slip underneath. Mm. So I, part of the, I think what I love about the collection is the way I create a collection is that there's the really extreme, you know, the mimosa, the last dress. But then there's these pieces that are, you know, very accessible. I can't like give up the accessibility of designing. Uh, you know, I have to do the fantasy, but I'm very grounded in certain reality. Uh, right. And then behind, just maybe on the topic of inspiration, um, we have some pieces from um, fall 2009 uh -huh. behind us. And I, just when we were earlier, chatting earlier, it's, the inspiration, in fact, started right here. So yeah. could you talk a bit yeah, about Yeah, when I got that? this email about coming to the Cooper U, I was like <laughs> hyperventilating. Because the inspiration for this collection was this exhibition that was here, I guess, a year and a half ago, Rococo, the Continuous Curve. Mm -hmm. And I, I was obsessed with the idea. Ron Arad, Frank Gehry, and so the, this is one of them as well. So the idea is like this continuous curve. So all the pattern pieces, um, my pattern maker was about to kill me. It's a <laughs> continuous pattern piece to create the collar. The same thing on the wool jacket. Um, and the, this dress in the middle, the orange, is um, from spring, but that was here for other reasons. And then, <laughs> And then this, as always, it's kind of like there's always the clean pieces, and I do a lot of leather. And then there's always the extravagant embellished pieces. That I think it's kind of like our wardrobes, you know. It's kind of you want, as a good friend of mine puts it, cake and frosting. So, <laughs> you know, I like a lot of frosting. <laughs> um, and I was talking with Aaron earlier about you know, walking around upstairs and seeing all of these d different design in disciplines together. And one thing that's different about fashion is that you know you have this kind of larger operating <coughs> system that you you work into in terms of producing collections twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of working in that process, whereas other designers might take on kind of an individual assignment. Um, you're always kind of working towards the next season. So I was just um, wondering if you could talk us through a typical evolution of a typical collection and 
Um, usually, it's like I said, it starts with the inspiration. Then I'll usually um, try to focus on, okay, a concept or a um, manipulation. So this was my manipulation. And I try to push it in as many directions as possible. And where would it be? Could it be in the hem of the skirt? So it's kind of, because you have to narrow it down. You only have like, you know, 10, 12 weeks, basically, by the time you finish all your other stuff and really get focused on it. So and it's, how far out do you start? Well, usually? like right now, I'm starting fall 10. So that's sourcing fabrics, sketching, draping, and it has to be finished by the end of January. Mm -hmm. So it's not a long time. And by contrast to you know, developing you know, an artist, they, they can work on a concept for a very long time. I have an artist friend who um, sculpts, and he's been working in the same sort of framework for about 10 years. And it's the same material, the same you know, sort of idea, mm -hmm. and it's very acceptable. Whereas in fashion, it's like it's so over. You know? <laughs> and you're still holding on to it, but that was such a good idea. <laughs> and it's like. Um, you, and you've already spoken a bit about your love for fabrics. In fact, I found a quote where you said you're a nut for fabrics. I think the better word would be obsession. <laughs> <laughs> um, will you just tell us about a few of your favorites? Um, my, some of my favorites are things like, um, well, I, like, I, I love embellishment. I love anything that has that hand applied element where you know that someone's actually, this skirt on the left is all embroidery through the top, the green lines, but the bottom is little folded pieces of um, um, uh, organza and a little crystal coming out of the middle. They look like lilies of the valley. And it's also a degradé, so it's like light, darker pink to light at the bottom. So it's stuff like that. But I also like really clean things, like right now for spring we launched a line of jersey. And it's very practical, it's very functional, it packs well. So it's kind of like a strange balance, I guess. A mix. Mm -hmm. Um, is there a particular garment, kind of past or present, that you're particularly proud of? Uh, yeah, um, I guess there's one skirt that always pops in mind when people ask a question like that. I did a skirt, and I called it um, La Dolce Vita, because the inspiration was that that season. But it's one panel of fabric, and it bustles. You might remember it, Rosemary. It bustles up in the back, mm. and, when you, and it has a waistband. But it bustles in the back, and it's like, and when you put it on, it's like this amazing ball skirt. And I've had clients buy it and have to, you know, go to some ball in, you know, Paris or something, and they're like, it folded into nothing. It was amazing. I didn't have all the, you know, hoo ha. And um, from a design point of view, it's so simple. But I appreciate things like that because of the simplicity. You know, sometimes you could focus on the very complex things and think, oh, that's so brilliant. But it's the simplicity I think that's even more uh, significant. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, OK, shifting gears back to the business end of things a bit. I mean, you've obviously experienced tremendous growth in the past few years. Um, but as, the case with, as is the case with many designers, there have been ups and downs. And um, you actually kind of closed your business for a few years, in the, like around 2000. So I'm just curious what, um, you know, what you did differently when you reopened. Um, I guess my first business, I was in business for 10 years. And it's been published, so I guess the audience deserves to know what was the reason. I'm sure you're all curious. Um, it was a combination of uh, embezzlement by a bookkeeper and then 9-11. And I was just like, enough. It was 10 years. And I realized I was working too isolated. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the resources and the team of people that could be um, helpful on a business level. So it just seemed like the right thing to do, and I was just, I needed a break. And um, so I closed for a ye two years, and um, the biggest difference was surrounding myself with people that were really brilliant in areas that I wasn't. Uh, business planning, accounting, all the boring stuff. And the good news is a lot of those people were so excited to work with someone like me because because their world is so you know, kind of black and white that when they heard about me or met me through friends, they were like, I'll write your business plan. And so I didn't think that it was out there. I was always a little intimidated by being able to afford those kind of things. And the reality was they were accessible. And so when I relaunched, that was a big part of it, and still is working with people that are really brilliant. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think it, I just think it's very interesting because obviously you have this you know, passionate design side, but then there must be this very practical you know, businesswoman and entrepreneurial side. Mm -hmm. So how you know, now, even with kind of the right support stuff, how do you divide your time between designing and business? Um, it, you know, it's the, it's, that's the biggest challenge ever. Every, I, 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 I struggle with it all the time. I'm very frustrated a lot of times because I want more time to design. But, you know, you kind of go get a reality check, be grateful to have a job, and find the time to do it. And so, you, I, you know, I'm very um, organized. So like you say, I have kind of two sides of the brain. So you get the practical stuff done so that you actually have time to do the 
to do what you, why you're even doing this whole thing. So it's just organization and management. Great. And then, um, yeah, so you opened your first boutique in the summer of 2008, um, you know, which I talked about in the introduction a bit. But can you tell us a bit more about this process, how you decided on the location, and then specifically you know, how you translated your design point of view into this architectural space? Uh, um, well, uh, I have it was really easy. I mean, I wanted the store. Uh, the neighborhood I chose was because I had, wanted my workrooms in the same building as my store. For at least for the first store, anyway. Um, and um, this is a great area. It's, it has a lot of energy, creative energy. There's a lot of uh, arts, art galleries and, and great restaurants, so it was you know, good for traffic. And I found really beautiful space that um, I worked with a designer. It was his first project. And he was terrified, because I called him one day and I said, I'm doing a store. How would you like to do it? And he was, bril he was brilliant. And we were, I think it worked well, because he knew me for about six or seven years, maybe longer. And he understood what I wanted. I wanted a gallery-like space, because he knows how I consider my work art. And I wanted a welcoming space that wasn't off-putting to clients, where I wanted people to come in and feel like you know it was an experience, they could relax. And, it, and everyone says that, even before I you know, say it. People come in and say, oh, the experience of being in your store is so nice. So he achieved it very nicely. Are you planning to open a second store? I, you know, I'm not sure, but I like the idea of it. It's very nice. Because as a designer, the biggest um, kind of letdown is that you create a collection. We cl I create a collection of about 40 looks. And every store comes to it with its own point of view. And so they're going to buy parts of it. They, don't, they can't buy the whole collection. Mm -hmm. And so with a store, you know, we show the whole collection unedited. And, um, and then I also have we carry other things like jewelry that complements the collection. So it creates kind of a whole vision, which is very nice. Great. Um, so shifting gears again, I just wanted to I guess, talk a bit about Michelle Obama, um, who came to you as a new customer around 2004, 2005. So mm -hmm. can you just tell us about how, she, how you guys got connected? Um, you know, like all my clients, she was referred. A friend of mine called me and she said, I met this woman last night and I know she'd be great in your clothes. Can, you know, I'd like to bring her in to meet you. And at that point, we were just, you know, I had a studio. Uh, I didn't have a store. So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And she came in and was just kind of like any other girl, any other client. And she was buying for her wardrobe. And uh, you know, people asked me, did you know she was wearing it? I didn't, had no idea. There, there's only been two occasions that I knew specifically she was wearing those pieces for. Mm -hmm. But the day at the White House in this dress, my mother called me at 10 o'clock in the morning. And mind you, she's 93 and blind in one eye. She goes, oh. I know it's your dress. I'm like, OK, we'll check it out. <laughs> so you know, I didn't know. And that's what's kind of cool about her, because it's kind of like it was very just like any other client. You know, I always like when, when I work with a client or my staff works with a client, we always talk about wardrobe and just having things like there. You know how frustrating it is when you're going out to, you know, well, you know, when you're going to the White House for the first time and you have to have a dress and it's not in your closet. You know how frustrating that is to find it. So. Um, <laughs> well, one thing that I discovered working on the book, um, it, and obviously your name had been so associated with Michelle Obama anyways, but as I was kind of doing photo research for the book, I mean, there was a tremendous amount of Maria Pinto designs worn by Michelle Obama, I think more than um, certainly I realized. So I just wanted to show a few examples. Um, just And these are early examples from early on the campaign trail. So this was um, a fabric used in your fall 2006 collection. Michelle mm -hmm. Obama was frequent, several times had worn a jacket. Mm -hmm. um, it had great bell sleeves It's a, well. it's a um, matte lisé, and it's a, it's a wool. It's so beautiful. It has a bit of purple. The color isn't as strong here. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, even, you know, so jackets, blouses, this is from spring 2007, and Michelle Obama had a two, um, mm -hmm. that, two, two versions, versions. The lace version. And when you like something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, it's we're, a good thing, right? There, there will be more, more of that. Um, and then a jacket mm. as well mm -hmm. that she had. In, the red. In red and black. Um, and then, of course, the famous she stresses, which um, you know, it was it, doing research. It was unbelievable to you know suddenly say, "Wait, I've seen this before," and then you know you, you keep ha that kept happening. You know, in this particular cut of a dress, I think five different um, variations. Variations. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just was curious, like if that was ever 
and this is really just skimming the surface. So is that ever a challenge to manage like that kind of output? I mean, it seems like more than kind of an average customer, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, not for our customer. <laughs> <laughs> our customers become addicted. <laughs> no, seriously, I have clients that say that, especially when they're the, I have a, I have um, a very um, diverse clientele, I would say. There, I have a lot of executive women, like a woman like Michelle, and then I have a lot of social like women. And the executive women are, you know, I, I'm sure many of you here are juggling a lot, so you know how streamlined and organized your wardrobe needs to be. You don't, so it became an issue where she just liked the sheath dress and she just you know, bought many of them. And I have a lot of clients like this that just, it becomes kind of like, it works. And I, you know, I'm sure she probably didn't anticipate being photographed quite so much. I know. <laughs> or I would have helped her on that one. <laughs> but it, and it worked, so it's sort of, there's nothing wrong with the idea of a uniform if it's functional and beautiful. Right, and I mean, this was someone who's having public appearances every single mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. um, you know, 365 yeah. days a year, so. And you know how fast that all ramped up. I mean, it was just sort yeah. of like overnight. Right. You know. Um, and so we just, you know, because the sheath dress has become this, you know, almost an icon in itself associated with Michelle Obama's style. Is, is this something that you produce kind of through like season to season for clients? Um, it's in the collection. I mean, as all collections, like if you look at the website, you'll see these 30 looks from the show. Um, for the showroom, we always have additional pieces that are your sort of, you know, more practical parts of the collection. So every season, I, I, I really believe in the dress. It's kind of like Paris slacks, you know, every season we have slacks. Um, and so the dress is always there in some new form or. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I thought we could take a look at a few, um, again, kind of starting early on, just a few of key looks that you um, designed for Michelle Obama. So this is actually 2005, um, Barack Obama's Senate swearing in ceremony. And this was your design? Yeah, and this was just from the collection. Um, it's a blouse that probably a lot of people, including Liz over there, may have. Um, it's a little racer cut chiffon blouse, and she's got great arms. And at that point, she still was, you know, she said it was a perfect suit to wear because she was able to take the jacket off and still feel appropriate. And um, yeah. Great. It's just history. And color is always important, I think. And then, you know, and I think in the interview for the book, you said you were, she needed the clothes for both her work and kind of social life. Mm -hmm. And so I think early, you know, these were kind of two occasions that were really celebrated in, mm -hmm. in the media. On the, um, on the left in your dress for the Oprah's mm -hmm. Legends Ball, and then on the right um, a few years later for the NAACP Image Awards. Yeah, yeah. Can you just tell us about these dresses um, a bit more? They were, uh, these are actually two, two dresses. This dress was, the fabric was specifically for her. The other dress was something that we developed for. At that, that season, I was kind of obsessed with pleats. And um, so that wrap is, um, it's a pleated wrap and a taffeta skirt. And it, and it was black or white. I'm like, you have to wear white. And it was really a beautiful gown on her. The back has beautiful detail you can't really see. And then this gown is an overprinted tool. And um, when she was on, the, they, they panned over her, and she was sitting next to Usher. I'm like, oh, my dress is sitting next to Usher. <laughs> okay, <laughs> always a bonus. <laughs> yeah, sort of different things that get you going. Um, but I thought, you know, these are kind of silhouettes that really work for her. I mean, she has such a great um, stature. She's amazing, mm -hmm. we all know that. And then when Barack Obama announced his run for um, presidency in Springfield, mm -hmm. this was unusual because, in fact, you didn't just design Michelle Obama's wardrobe no. this day. We did the girls. It was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle's coat is an alpaca coat. And every season, I always do. Coats are always really important. Chicago, you know. And um, this day was I've read it. I mean, it was freezing cold freezing. in Springfield. But so her po coat was alpaca, and she said, "I need something for the girls." And so she brought them in, and we let them pick. And I, we didn't let them pick the. She wanted black. Sasha and Malia was really cute, and we picked colors for the linings, and they had a blast with it. So. Yeah, the hot pink definitely mm -hmm. fits Sasha. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the again, you know, in the book, you mentioned this dress, which is from um, a fundraiser at Oprah's house mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of one that you particularly, um, you know, like. Yeah, I love this dress. It's all um, hand manipulated, uh, hand applied uh, ribbons, the whole dress. And then the collar are, are all these little flowers made out of ribbons. And um, it's kind of a ra racer back in a way, sort of center back. And um, Barack was very generous. He got on stage, Oprah introduced him, and she says, um, 
and he was going to introduce Michelle, and he goes, doesn't she look beautiful? In fact, the designer's here today, in front of like 1,200 people oh. in Oprah's garden. And it was like, OK, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and Oprah's worn, I saw a fabulous picture of Oprah in this um, like leather skirt yeah, of yours. For the great debaters, the premiere in LA was great. Cognac leather. Beautiful. <laughs> Um, another you know, very popular ensemble, I must say, uh, this was born on the campaign trail in, in San Juan mm -hmm. and um, was your top and skirt. And the top is very interesting. If you could tell us about how that was constructed. This was part of um, spring, oh, I'm not sure which year anymore. But the inspiration was Richard Serra. And it's oh. all, it's about, I'd say 70 pieces, the whole collar. They're all squares and they're hand, t um, you know, tacked on. And they create this amazing, like, crazy color. And, and it's you a did, cotton. did you do this in a few fabrics, too? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, great. And then the famous sheath dress. Yeah. So this was worn when they won, Obama won the primary mm -hmm. in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And this dress, you know, has, I, I also I read another quote from you where you said, you know, it's funny, you know, who figured, who, Go figure, but that you've spent all this time developing, you know, laces and fabrics, and you know, and it's mm. this kind of very classic, simple sheath dress mm. that gets so much attention. But it truly, it, I mean, it did. Mm -hmm. So, what's the, um, you know, what's the magic? Do you think? In I, I read another quote where you said, kind of, that there are many trick, little tricks of cut. So, you know, could you give us some insight into that? Well, I mean, cut and fit, especially. Um, I mean, it's just the way how far in the shoulder is, for example. It's kind of, it, we're talking centimeters, how far the shoulder is cut in that actually makes the shoulder look stronger. Um, uh, the, the height of the armhole, the, the placement of the seam that creates shape for the bust and the waist, um, all those parts. And, you know, where you define the waist, because as you shape a dress, you're defi yeah, at some point you define where the waist starts. So there's sometimes you cheat a little bit. It's not exactly where, because no one's waist, I mean, everyone in the room, I could take your neck to waist measurement and no one would be the same. So you have to find that sort of, where does it work for most people? Mm -hmm. And so there's little parts like that. And it's, it's a really cool part of the process because um, you de de develop a pattern and then you put it into a fabric like a, it's called muslin, it's kind of cotton. And you get it on a, a, man, a woman, a body, real person. and. Um, and then you start, that's where the sculpture comes. And that's my favorite part. It's because you're pinning, and, and it's like an infinitesimal amount that could sometimes make a big difference and drive everyone crazy because you become fanatical about it. But that's ultimately what ends up showing, and I think so, sets it apart. And people, I mean, people even say now, um, when, you know, now when Michelle Obama will wear one of your dresses, they'll say, I knew that was a Maria Pinto design because of how it fit her. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it seems, and this is something, as I talk to different um, journalists in, within the fashion industry, they also acknowledge. So how, you know, how do you think that this, how did this become such a strong suit for you? The fitting issue? Yeah. Um, because the cut, cutting, I guess. Um, again, I think because cut is like sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I, you know, I, I think part of what I want for my client is for them to look amazing. And so if it doesn't fit well, I mean, it could be a beautiful dress. How many beautiful dresses up, end up on sale because they don't fit anyone? So it's kind of, it's, a, it's, you know, I didn't notice it so much until people started pointing it out to me, how, oh man, your clothes fit great. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like something you constantly work at. I mean, and there's things you consider, like I remember um, years ago when I first started doing more of the daytime pieces, I was developing pants and I realized that my clientele was probably mostly between uh, not much younger than 30 and up. And a lot of them, even the young women, had had a child. And what happens to a woman she has a child is usually, I mean, if they get back to their normal weight, their waist changes. So their waist is usually an inch to two inches bigger by ratio to the rest of their body. So I modified my patterns to accommodate that because that's the reality, you know? So it's crazy practical stuff like that, which is, uh, you know, sometimes bores me to think about, but it's like I know that's important because I don't want to end up on the sale rack. <laughs> I know. Um, it makes sense. That, and I, I read another quote from you where a journalist asked you what your, who your favorite designers were, and you mentioned Azadine Alaya. Yeah. And so I was just, you know, when you see, you know, your work paired with an Alaya piece here, the, the famed Alaya belt, now it sort of has its own mystique. <laughs> um, you know, is that 
Is this something you do too? I mean, I'm sure in your Absolutely. own life. Yeah. yeah. I, I told her to go buy it. <laughs> I don't do belts, damn it. Um, no, no, I, Eli is one of the mo masters in my opinion. He's a master cutter. His aesthetic is beautiful. It's about a woman's body. It's sexy, it's feminine. His materials are beautiful. I've always admired his work. Great, and then another, um, you know, incredibly high profile moment because I think this was the first night of the DNC and really, uh, you know, Michelle Obama was the primetime keynote speaker of that evening and um, really one of the first occasions when, you know, kind of the whole of the nation um, got to hear her voice kind of at one time and she chose your design for that moment. So did you know in advance at all? Uh -huh. No. No, I swear, I tell you. <laughs> Ask me, you know, I have three close friends here. They all know. Is she wearing your dress? I don't know. And, and that's, what's, that's what I respect about her, because it's yeah. not like so premeditated. Mm -hmm. And um, if that's how she felt, you know, how you are. I mean, so often we have, okay, so your wedding day, you've got one dress, you're not gonna have three dresses. But, you know, it's like often you'll have a few things to choose from, and how you feel that day is kind of what you're gonna maybe wear, right? So it's, I think that's how she, it works for her. Can you tell us more about, more about this dress? Um, the idea was, this kind of came off of a sort of 50s, I mean I love the 50s because it's very sexy and feminine and it's very, um, it's a woman's body. And uh, it's an ampere seam, it's um, double faced crepe, wool crepe, and it's great because it's really, uh, there's no seam on the shoulder so it's cut on the bias, so that's what gives it that really nice closeness to the body. And the rest is just like really clean and um, it's kind of like a column, I like that. It was Shoulders. Around this time too, I think um, you know the show Mad Men was having quite a moment, and mm -hmm. Mad Men enthusiasts went crazy over this, mm -hmm. this dress for being of that mm -hmm. you know kind of a vintage inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the first um, first meeting at the White House, another kind of very historic mm -hmm. moment. Um, again, Michelle Obama chose one of your dresses, which we're so fortunate to have right there too. Um, <laughs> So can you tell us a bit more about this design too, in particular, particular the detail of the neckline? Um, that season I was working with a lot of like folds and manipulation like this. And um, again, it's ampere, so it's kind of like it really like, uh, I like how that defines the shoulder. And it's this, you know, uh, elongating. I like things that make you longer, being 5'3", I guess I'm obsessed. And um, it's just, you know, again, it's one of those easy kind of, wearable dresses, but still obviously makes a statement. And then actually just recently, um, Michelle Obama wore it again mm -hmm. um, in September. Mm -hmm. And that's what's cool about her too, I think, because it's kind of like, you know, this is reality. I mean, who buy, I mean, I, I think it's really brave of her to wear a dress a second time. I mean, you know, how many women in her position would? And I think it's a good message to the rest of us that we don't have to, you know, a lot of women buy a dress for a special occasion, very important occasion, and then they think they can never wear it again. So. Yeah, and I think too, even you know, sticking with thing, silhouettes and that work. So you know, even though that she dress, we showed sort of five different versions of it were worn. But I think it's probably a testament to it being a piece that really worked for her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Were there any dresses in your recent collection that you'd love to see Michelle um, Obama wear? Yeah, there's a couple. I there's one. Uh, part of Tango was a lot of hand manipulated flowers and there's a dress that's a lightweight wool and it's um, kind of a deep purple color, you know which one, and it has these roses made out of the same fabric that is a square neck and they're on the shoulder and it's, you know, again, kind of clean shape. I think she'd be stunning in that. Great. Um, and since we have these beautiful pieces behind us, um, can, and we, you know, we've talked about a few of them, but we haven't really talked too much about this one. Could you just um, tell us a bit more about, about this? Um, this one, it's, you know, a lot of times with embellishment, I like that it's really, the foundation of it is very simple kind of idea in terms of the silhouette. So it's, and I, but I like the juxtaposition of, you know, the leather corset, which is a beautiful, if you can't see it probably so well, but it's like it was purple to green which kind of pulls out of the feather. Um, the rab is really special because these are coke feathers, but the feathers are all burnt, the back end, and then so that's what creates that sort of movement. It's a lot about movement, I think, when I create pieces. So by burning the back of the feather, it created this like uh, stem, and then that's hand beaded on. And then the skirt, the feathers were uh, strung into with beads. So when you wear it, the, the feathers really move. They're not like, if you look at a cheap version of something like this, they'd be just sewn down. 
And so that's what's interesting. I was, I'm working on a project. We're doing um, some of my coats for reversible to cashmere. So I went to see the, I went to work with the manufacturer today. And, and if you really see the process of how things are made, you'd have a new sense of thoughtfulness in terms of what, what you own. I mean, when you see how a, coat, a fur coat's made, it's amazing. They have to stretch all the skins. They cut the pattern pieces out. Then it's stretched on a board. And, uh, you know, so there's the whole coat, but it's open, splayed open like a, you know, like a skeleton. It's pretty cool. And so that's, th those pieces, it's really about that sort of the craftsmanship, the workmanship. Mm -hmm. And then I know we talked a bit about the in, um, inspiration behind the continuous curve of mm -hmm. the coat. But what, can you tell us more about this fantastic button up by oh, the yeah. neck, too, and the fabric? The um, button is resin, and it's like carved like a rose. And the fabric, I mean, I love winter because of the layers of textures. And we paired these two together. This is um, just a beautiful wool. And I thought the coloration and the pattern, and the back is really beautiful. I have to show you the back. Sure. <laughs> I don't drop the kit mannequin, or flip the mannequin over. Look at the back. Isn't that great? And then we paired it with things like that because it's like a little wool chalet dress. And um, they kind of look together. I like the contrast of the two patterns. And the coat has a fabulous lining, mm -hmm. kind of a real hot, a hot yeah. thing. Show that's, that too. <laughs> that's kind of another obsession. I never line anything in black. There's purple. <laughs> Why do black when you could do color? Like, who would want to, like, you know, drop your coat off with that? I think I'll keep it on. <laughs> so always like fun splashes of color and, and it's silk charmeuse. And that's the other thing people always say to me. I mean, I really like the, someone said to me, how do you choose fabrics? And I said, it's how it, how you, like my fabrics, you want it, it feels great, so you, it feels good against your skin, but people want to touch it. Yeah. So like, you know, it's kind of, there's a seduction to it. So there's nothing better than, you know, you're sitting with a, you know, Thank God, no more first dates, I hope, anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, you're on a date, and he's like, oh, what is that? You know, it's like, OK, we're on to a good start. No, it's very seductive. The fabrics I use are seductive. Anyone here that's a, I know you're here. You know what I'm talking about. And I think that's why, you know, I, someone asked me about clearing her closet. And I said, oh, here we go. And she, she's, I said, take your favorite piece. You know how we all have a piece that when you wear it, you feel like, I'm invincible. I'm going to get this new account or whatever. And put that on the, in the middle of your closet. And everything else, if it doesn't stack up to at least 75%, pitch it. And so you know, I think that that's, I think those are the kind of pieces that I want to provide to my clients, pieces that are, every piece makes you feel really amazing in it or why have it. Yeah. So any, um, I know you mentioned sort of being inspired by some fur pieces, but anything else that you know, has you inspired at the moment that we should be, maybe give us a hint about um, fall 2010. Oh, it's, yeah, it's very in the incubator stage, but <laughs> the inspiration is Ducati motorcycles. Oh. <laughs> but what's kind of cool about the inspirations, like I said, the seasons are sort of very fast. So you're never really finished with one. I, I've, I've noticed this, like after I finish a collection, I go, oh, that kind of crept back in. Mm. So I'm sure like this continuous curve idea, just the idea of how fluid pattern pieces could work, and past, um, like the tango, I'm, I'm sure that's sort of somewhere in the back of my head. But the motorcycle thing is really cool because there's so much about um, the whole, also getting into an inspiration is the culture. So I'm kind of into like, Meeting bikers now, getting into the culture, the, <laughs> the, the mindset. No, seriously, getting into the mindset of it. Like I met these tango dancers. There was this whole thing in Chicago, unbeknownst to me, right in the middle of the collection. This um, Argentine consulate uh, created this big um, tango a, a weekend, and there were these like seventy-year-old, the seventy-year-old couple dancing tango. And then there was this 22-year-old couple. Well, needless to say, the 22-year-olds, they were like flipping each other in the air, and it was really fabulous. But you should have seen the 70-year-old couple. <laughs> they were amazing. They were like the epitome of what you think about tango and two people in love. I mean, that's what tango is about. It's like passion, love. It's sex on the dance floor. I mean, and so that's going to you know, resonate, I'm sure. But the Ducati thing, there's a psychology that I'm still trying to understand with the whole bike world. 
happening. And how does that, I mean, how do you go from like tango to bikers? It's so fast. It depends on who you're dating. No, 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 uh, no, 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 no. Um, it depends, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of what you're exposed, you know, it's like you have two seconds to decide what your inspiration is going to be, kind of. So it's always things that are sort of formulating and out there. Um, the tango thing, uh, I was in Argentina two years ago, and I had always had that in the back of my mind to do. Um, the bicycle thing, I have many friends that ride bikes. There's this, I mean, the bicycles are amazingly cool, especially the vintage ones and the colors that they use. So the color story is right there. It's gorgeous. And, and then it's sort of, it's really more the psychology of it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm using leathers that are so crazy, you can't even stand it. The finishes are laser cut. So Where do those come from? Italy. Yeah. Cool. It's still in the incubation stage, so it's really hard. Give me another so three, three months, I'll tell you, you'll see exactly what it is, okay. what happened. Good to get a My wacko seat. brain. Uh -huh. Well, I think we um, want to open up to the audience if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. Back to the inspiration. I mean, you know you have to have a collection coming. And do you seek out the inspiration, or does something just happen around you where you you see a Ducati and you think, oh, that's going to be it? Mm -hmm. or, or does, you know, does, is it, how does it come about that you pick something that is the inspiration for a collection? Um, I think it's, you know, it's kind of like I saw this exhibition here, the Rococo exhibition, probably um, six months or so before I used it. And it just stayed in my head and I bought the book. And so then it's sort of like, I'm, okay, here we go. We have to, I, I never like to start shopping for fabrics until I know exactly the parameters. So it's kind of usually the things that are I kind of collect. So, so they're there. there and, and it's around. It's, it's yeah. Cooking. The books are there or there's a, you know, yeah. something that keeps the reminder of it. Have you ever been in a situation where you have kind of you know, a few potential routes to go in or is yeah. it, okay. Oh, I have mountains of them. <laughs> I have books, I have travels, I have fantasies. No, there's always, you know, it's just defining and committing to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what, you know, how do you decide that that's right for right now? You know what, I don't, I, I think you can't overthink things. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to commit and go with it. If you overthink, it's like, it sort of destroys a lot of things that need to be fluid and kind of organic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, first of all, I think you're great. Oh, thank um, you. I think this is always fabulous. Um, uh, thank you very much. Your work, although you've mentioned uh, influences that are international in nature, still in all, the end product is distinctly Chicago or Midwest or this feel, no, uh, the best part, I mean, of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to some extent, I don't know that we've seen a designer who represents the middle of the country mm -hmm. um, uh, since Norman Norell, perhaps. Um, uh, is that because it's in your bones? Or do you think that's not a accurate appraisal of your work? Uh, um, I don't know. I've never heard it put that way. And most of the time, most of the time people really think I'm from another place. You know, they're like, you're really from Chicago? You do this in Chicago? I don't believe it. So I never really relate to it in that way. But it's okay. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Thank you. Is there anything, but just, I guess, building on that, is there anything, uh, you know, sort of catering to a Chicago customer? Like, do you do more coats or something? No. no? Because in fact, um, no. Our, our, I don't think about a specific place at all. Mm -hmm. I have a good coat store. I went down to Memphis. I can't say the name of the store. And um, I brought coats. And it was like one of my first you know, years in business, cashmere, beautiful coats. And the owner of the store came up to me in front of like the whole staff of 20. Excuse me. This is Memphis, darling. We don't, our co we're not going to be selling cashmere coats. Okay. At the end of the sh two days, we sold about 15 coats. <laughs> so, yeah. I digress. <laughs> so you mentioned, um, you know, your inspiration and being motorcycles now and, and other inspirations that you've had. But how do you kind of forecast the demand from society? So, you know, you have an inspiration, but how do you get that kind of 
thing that you know people are going to grab onto? How do you kind of forecast that in nine months in advance? You mentioned January for fall, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I, again, I think it's one of those guttural things that I don't overthink. Um, I kind of listen to a certain amount of it, and then I stop. You know, I'll, I listen, get a lot of feedback from my uh, agent in New York who sells to the stores. I get feedback from clients that shop in our store. And then once I start the collection, I stop listening to everybody. And then, you know, hope, so far I've gotten it right. I think if you listen too much, you start getting all, you start going off in different directions, and it's, it's too much information. Mm -hmm. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your relationship to color? Because it's such um, an important part, even from black to the amazing kind of orange red back there. And just the color seems to really have an important part in your, um, in your art. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, um, again, it's one of those things I don't really like think a lot about. But I, uh, I think, you know, I like that we have choices. I mean, there's times where black. And then it's really great when you can throw on a red dress. Um, I think color is very expressive and can be, you know, um, um, I don't, it's hard for me to define more than that. I just am I'm, I'm obsessed with color. I'm obsessed with color in terms of, uh, you know, just even in your home, like how we decorate our homes or the colors in our walls, the art we choose. I think color just, uh, color is probably the, one of the most self expressive um, elements, I think, in how we dress, don't you? comes from that, maybe. hope that's a good answer for you. I'm curious because it's kind of these really deep jewel tones, and it could be just what we're seeing as opposed to maybe pastels, or just yeah. there's a, an intensity. Really yeah, I, I definitely le lean towards the intense color side of the palette. But um, yeah, I don't know how else to, yeah. I don't know how else to be. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any hopes to expand your audience? Um, oh, oh, always. Um, <laughs> I think the aud in audience in terms of the who the women are or yeah, how we distribute. Like size and um, what right? is your audience, I guess, now? It's yeah. sort of a um, <clears throat> I would say she's probably 30 to 70. I have the rock star 92-year-old client in Chicago. You can't even <laughs> imagine this woman. Oh, my god. Um, I think she's um, really um, strong-minded, has a really good sense of herself, especially up till you know being more of a brand that people are starting to recognize. My customers are really like they buy because they love it, and they weren't obsessed with it having a label on the inside that was very recognizable. So obviously, she's a very sophisticated, intellectual, intelligent woman, and um, expanding beyond that, I. I think I have the best of it already. Um, Distribution-wise, yes, I'd like to you know, expand where we distribute. Um, as far as size, we size size 2 to 14. Um, I think we're too small a brand to go beyond that, because then it becomes a whole other classification and you know, distribution. So for now, I think I have to stay a little focused and a little narrow. I was at something a couple weeks ago, and a man said, I think you do great men's clothes. I'm like, oh, no, it's <laughs> not going to happen. What about jewelry? Just um, what about jewelry? Oh, I love jewelry. <laughs> Again, I can't. I have to say no. I have to stay focused. Everyone tells me so. <laughs> so I have good jewelry friends that I fulfill my obsession with. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Maria, I've had the pleasure of being in your Chicago store recently, uh. and how um, I'd love you to elaborate on how your experience is having your own store versus wholesaling. Um, do you work on the sales floor, and how often do you do that, or do you have to make a private appointment to have a fitting with you? Um, I love having a store. It's so great. You can put every, you can have exactly what you want, exactly where you want to have it. I have jewelry in the store um, that's really beautiful, and that complements the collection, which excites me. Um, I, I'm on the floor whenever I want to be, or by appointment. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I like being on the floor. It's really, I love meeting my clients. And um, I like seeing how things work. I like seeing that certain styles work on so many body types. That's very, I mean, like I have a little schizo. I mean, as being a designer, there's a lot of designers that, you know, they don't want to think about that kind of stuff. 
And I think it's really important to think about that stuff. And I like the fact that I can honor women's bodies because none of us are the same. And my, a great dress can work on many women. So that's it. One thing, and you mentioned that you know, your production is housed upstairs. Just give us kind of a peek behind that curtain. What, like, you know, how is that staffed? How many people? Um, there's 20 people upstairs. And how it looks is when no one's working, I'll, I'll go in on a Saturday and open the door, and it's like 5,000 square feet. I'm like, am I crazy? That's how it looks. <laughs> no, it's really great. It's really exciting. I have the most amazing people working with me, um, from pattern makers that have been working for 30 years to um, seamstresses that have come here that were doctors in their country, from Poland, Russia, Vietnam. I have my first employee from Vietnam. She came, she could not speak a word of English. I called the Vietnamese Place and Center. She learned English, she now runs the sewing team. Um, and so we were like, I mean, I hate to use that expression, family, but you know, we, we're a very, um, we're a great collection of interesting people. And, being in Chicago also gives them a great opportunity because there are not a lot of businesses in Chicago like mine. So it gives them an opportunity to use their skills. And um, they're very protective and very loyal. And that's a good thing. <laughs> um, you mentioned, I mean, obviously, we learned that you've, you're designing for Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey. If you could design for one person, past or present, like who would be your dream person to design to, to dress? Oh, that's always a loaded question. Um, <laughs> we won't tell. <laughs> um, I guess, I, I mean, like, because a big part of what people expect you to dress or are looking to see who you dress, obviously, is celebrity. So if I had to think of actresses, I always want to think of actresses that I really respect as far as, like, really having integrity. You know, it's not going to be Lindsay Lohan. Not because she doesn't have integrity. Oh, my God, her aunt's probably here. Um, it's, I mean, it's someone that, again, like I... Um, explain who I think my customer is. It would have to be one of those kind of actresses. Charlize Theron would be amazing. Um, Kate Blanchett. Um, you know, women like that. So I've never been that uh, focused on it. Maybe I should be. <laughs> but if you have any girlfriends that are actresses and would look great in my clothes, let me know. <laughs> Take your card. Especially if they're up for an Academy Award. <laughs> Hi. Uh, looking back from your experience, how do you think that the marketing is important as uh, as, as important as the designing? I didn't hear. The how would you uh, advise us to market yourself? To marketing. To marketing, marketing? Your, marketing yourself. To marketing. Your brand, I guess. Uh, Louise, um, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, it's a, you know it's a change. To me, what it all looks like is a, it's a constantly changing environment. And it's, I'm constantly seeing like new opportunities, but then you think, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's like, you, for me, it's like being in the right stores that represent me well. Like we're in Takashimaya here in Chicago, New York, and they do a beautiful job representing me. Um, you know, having great opportunities like being in her beautiful new book, which you should all get. Yeah. Um, so it's things like that, and it's sort of, I don't know. It's not my area of expertise. I'm still looking to find that person that's going to drive me to the next level in that area. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I have one final question, too. Do you have a favorite, um, favorite item in your own closet you can tell us about? My favorite item of the moment. See, this is why I don't have children. Because you know, you'd be my favorite today and tomorrow. <laughs> Because I consider my, my collection, like, they're all like my little children. I have a wrap that everyone should have. I wear it, and I wore it here to New York last time. It's all pleats, and it's the easiest thing to wear. It's made out of wool, and you put it on, and it almost looks like a jacket. And I was walking through Barney's, and about six people came up to me wanting to know what it was. And it's just the easiest piece. It packs. It, you know, it's like the functional, but really aesthetically amazing. A woman wore it to, um, to Valencia, Spain, for a Calatrava opening. And someone came over to her and said, is that a Calatrava wrap? I didn't know he did wraps. And she's like, no, no, no. And um, so um, it's a really kind of staple, great piece, but has a lot of you know, attitude. Wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, I started in wraps and scarves. Yeah. Did you ever work for a fans designer? Um, no. Like full time? No. Mm -mm. no. So it was all self-taught. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> you wouldn't recommend it. 
No. Uh, no. I mean, if I had the, I mean, I tell students all the time that come to visit my studio, I would say take the time to work for other companies because there's far too much to learn. And um, I was just too anxious. You know, I was 33, I was over the hill. I needed to get started. <laughs> but um, I definitely recommend to people to work for other companies in different areas, too, because you know, I, I, I'll get a class of 30 students, and there's like seven schools in fashion in Chicago. I mean, how many of these students are really going to have the opportunity to become fashion designers? And I say, you know, you should explore all aspects of fashion, because you could be a writer. You could be a publicist. You could be a you know, pattern maker. Look at, find what's your passion within fashion. Oh, <laughs> so, that's kind of what I would recommend. I learned a lot hard, the hard way. So if you, because we were talking earlier about the few years that you spent with Jeffrey Bean, so would you, you know, I guess, then you immediately plunge into launching your own business. Mm -hmm. well, obviously, it sort of worked out for you, but mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to do it over, do you think you would have kind of worked for different houses first? Yeah. I would, I would think it'd be an important part of it. It's an important part of the experience. I have a nephew who's studying uh, fashion, and he's brilliant. And everyone's like, he should just come work for you. I'm like, absolutely not. He doesn't have a job here until he goes and works for someone else for at least three years. Because I don't want to deprive him of the experience, because he's really brilliant. And I think that he would learn much more by being in different environments and you know, getting kicked around a little, frankly. <laughs> And uh, learn, you know, so you need to learn. And you, I, I tell students all the time, don't deprive yourself. I have this girl, she's 16, 15 years old. How old are you when you graduate high school? She just got, um, she started sewing clothes out of her, she, it's, the story is so much like mine. She started selling, sewing clothes, selling them to girlfriends in high school. She just, uh, she's on the verge of finishing high school. She got a full scholarship to Harvard because she wrote this business plan that everyone is like all over the place. She went to Washington and she's getting all these awards. And she came to see me and she wants me to mentor her. And I said, why are you going to Harvard? She goes, well, because I really love business. I said, OK, but how much do you love fashion? I really love fashion. I said, if I were you, I said, I'm going to throw, I mean, this is hard to sell to someone who thinks they have their life all figured out right now, Harvard scholarship. I said, if you really want to be in fashion, I think you should study fashion. You could learn the business. I mean, you could find the business experts. If you don't get the business fashion background, you're not going to go to someone and say, design dresses. Help me figure out how to design dresses, how to cultivate. You have to cultivate your craft. And you should continue that process after school. It's not just school. It's just the scratching the surface. Yeah. We're just all a very anxious culture, aren't we, society? Wonderful. Um, and I guess a, a concluding question. You know, if you sort of in this 20, 20 year almost career, um, you know, what are some of the most valuable lessons that you've learned? I don't know if I've learned really any. Um, patience, I guess. I mean, that's what I probably just said. It's like mm -hmm. being patient, not being so anxious. Um, and I guess the biggest thing is really um, celebrating everything that happens. Because you're so caught up in the next thing that you're, you don't even take a minute. I have a good friend, and he's like, you never sit in the afterglow. I mean, I did my first show in New York. I always show during Fashion Week. But this season, we did our first presentation by invitation to the press and buyers in the Meatpacking District. And it was unbelievable success. The Women's Wear Daily said we had the best leather in town. This is like Wednesday night. Thursday morning at 6 AM, I'm on a plane back to Chicago. And I, you don't even like think about it. Like, this is amazing. I mean, we just had a room full of like 400 people. And you're just like back in the ditches. It's like, it's awful. So I'm learning to celebrate more. Yeah, and enjoy those it. moments. Yeah. Great. Um, if there are no more questions, yes. So I, oh, go ahead. So I think, um, you know, upstairs there, well, you're, as Aaron said, I think everyone's welcome to admire Maria's beautiful work that we're so lucky to have here. Um, and then upstairs, um, the bookstore has, um, if you're interested, copies of the Mrs. O book for sale. Um, that I'd be happy to sign, hope that Maria will. And as a bonus, um, I think the wonderful Peter Swornen is in the audience too, so you might be able to snag his, his autograph. Um, and then the exhibit's open for people to um, walk around and enjoy. So thank you so much.